everybody. Uh, so, okay, so this is going to be a little bit weird with the slides because uh, apparently Apple doesn't like when you alt tab out of slides, but let's see what happens. Uh, so my name is John. Uh, uh, C. John Run is my kind of name everywhere. It's on Twitter. It's on GitHub. Um, if anyone, uh, I'll just give you a brief of what I am. So currently I work at Square. I work at Square here in New York. I work typically on our, our, our Ruby applications, but I also do a lot of work in JavaScript um, and a little bit of work in Java. Uh, before that, I had a company called Broad Street Ads, which was a startup of mine. Uh, before that, I've worked at Tumblr, Brewster, and Patch. Um, I do a lot of work in Ruby. Uh, I also was a core contributor for CodeIgniter, which is a PHP framework, so anyone that is more interested in that side of things, I've done that too. Uh, but the goal here is kind of just to say that, like, I've used Vim across a variety of different applications at a variety of different companies and in a variety of different uh, languages. So I think it's good to start by talking, I guess, about like evolution of how I got to Vim. Uh, I think probably a lot of people's uh, layout looks something similar to this. Uh, there's a lie somewhere in here where there's a NetBeans or an Eclipse, but we don't have to talk about that. Uh, so we start with like Pico. Uh, if anyone is familiar with Pico, Pico, you might, uh, you might have called it Nano. Uh, Nano was basically Pico with syntax highlighting. So if you just took syntax highlighting away from Nano and imagine how great that would be, that's what Pico was. Uh, Pico is actually packaged alongside the, a thing called the Pine email reader on early Unix systems. So like, if you really go far back, you'll know about Pico. Uh, after that, I became, uh, I guess, an Emacs fanatic. Uh, I don't know how often you guys hear this. Is this how many meetups have you had? <laughs> anyone? 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 No? <laughs> so uh, you probably hear people coming from Emacs a lot into Vim. At least I hear it a lot. At Square, we have people divided between Vim and Emacs, but mostly, uh, mostly Vim now. Uh, but at some point, I saw it as a strength that Emacs had things like Snake built into it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, in Emacs, you can actually like, play Snake inside Emacs. And I saw it as like a strength that this full-featured IDE could have features so powerful they could even play a game like, like Snake. Um, but over time, I realized that Emacs is a bit clunky and too heavy for my purposes, so I ended up switching to Vim. That was about five years ago, and I haven't looked back since. Uh, so even when people start going through, uh, I guess it was Sublime, and now it's, um, what's, the, what's so Atom, right? Uh, even in those, I try them out, I try to install Vim key bindings, and I find myself going back uh, pretty quickly. I imagine a lot of you do as well. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to talk about uh, my Vim setup. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of Tmux stuff just because it intertwines really well. Um, let's get into it. So let me just start by saying generally I'm a purist on a lot of things. Uh, you're going to find throughout this presentation that I uh, favor the default configuration for pretty much everything, rather than trying to customize things. But there are definitely situations where uh, I go for plugins, and I hope that I can outline the ones that I use for you. Uh, so first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go top down from the things that are probably least debatable to the things that are most debatable. So the first one is the color schemes that I use. Uh, you're probably familiar with both of these, I hope. Uh, the one on the right is kind of a typical uh, uh, Vim color scheme. I like it because it doesn't have too many colors, doesn't have too little colors, it's kind of just right in the middle. And the one on the left has made kind of a, a big push over the past four years across a variety of different platforms. For anyone that's not heard of that one, it's an ultra-readable color scheme uh, called Solarized. Uh, there are two variants of it. There's a dark variant and a light variant. Uh, I find that I use the one on the right on pretty much everything I do, unless the screen is really small or the text is really small, in which case I end up switching to the one on the left, because it makes the text a bit clearer. Who's heard of Vundle or uses Vundle? Uh, I, I tend to call it Vundler uh, because it's, it's kind of built after the idea of Bundle in Ruby. Uh, so for some reason, I call it Bundler or Vundler. Uh, so for those of you that haven't heard of it, it's similar to Pathogen, if you've heard of that, but it's essentially a package manager for uh, Vim plugins. My VimRC is the only file that I have. So that's my, my, everything of my Vim configuration lives in one single file. And the reason that that's able to, to happen is because I use uh, Vundle. So you can write any of these three lines, and they would all mean the exact same thing in Vundle. And what they do is, let me just give you a, a quick sample. Uh, so on each of these slides, and I'll send these out later, there's URLs at the bottom where you can go investigate these things. Um, and each one's going to accompany kind of a quick little 
uh, probably broken foray into this world. So what it lets you do, if I open my vimrc, you can see that in my vimrc, I've actually just got a bunch of these bundle commands. And what they do is they reference Git repositories that have, or can either be on GitHub or any kind of Git source, but typically are on GitHub. And what you do is you run bundle install, and it'll go through each of the dependencies, and it'll install each of them. So it's going quick this time because it's already been installed, but if we take a quick look uh, at the .vim directory, you can see that what it's actually done is it's actually gone and checked out each of those repositories into, my bun into this bundle directory that lives inside of vimrc, and then it's included that. So this is nice for a few reasons. One, you don't have to make copies of every single file when you want to include it, but I think even more importantly, when updates come out to these plugins, you get them for free just by running bundle install again. And feel free to, any, if anyone has questions through any of this, just raise your hand. Uh, the next part of my setup that I, and first I'm going through just kind of general things, I'll get into plugins in a second. The next part of my setup I wanted to talk about was color column. So who uses color columns? Do people use color columns? I go back and forth on this, uh, and I'll show you quickly what a color column is, and then I will uh, show you an alternative to it that is also viable. So if you see over to the right there, the red line. The red line exists at my 80 character column inside Vim. I think generally it's good to stay within uh, 80 or 120 characters. Uh, so I put this here as a guide to myself. I'm not afraid to go over it, but I do mentally like curse myself a little bit internally when I cross this line. Um, so the way you get that is with these two lines here. First you set the text width, which can either be 80 or 120 or whatever you want to set it to. And then you'll set the color column, and you can also set the color color uh, I don't remember what the, maybe color column color something, uh, to some offset to the text width where you want to put this line. So you can say that you want it plus five, and that'll say I'm al allowing myself to go over text width by five. And the reason for that is that text width has other meanings inside Vim, like when do I wrap um, automatically. The alternative here, let me just show you what the alternative does. Uh, so the alternative will do this. Uh, typically that's what happens. The alternative will color anything over 80 characters. Uh, so the reason I go back and forth on which one I like here is that it's nice to um, have the color column, but it's, it's a little bit annoying to always see the line on the screen. Um, and you would actually think that these came in the other order that they actually did, because the one that is more recent to the Vim community as, as of 7.3 is actually color column. Color column is the new one. Uh, so if you ever see someone with a bunch of lines on their screen, they're using color column. Um, honestly, my configuration goes back and forth between these two pretty often, because I'm just not decided. So like I said, uh, I do minimal remapping inside my vimrc file. Pretty much these are the only remappings that I allow myself to do. And uh, they don't really count as remappings. All they do is they turn off the arrow keys. Uh, so it, it took me a while to get here. I'm sure it takes everyone a while to get here, but um, eventually uh, you let go of them and just use you know, J and K and H and L to move around. Uh, another policy of mine is splits all over, or splits over all. Uh, so I use splits for pretty much everything. Uh, I try to stay away from using tabs too much. I find that it leads to confusion about what's currently open in the editor, especially since I, you'll find, don't use something like nerd tree. Uh, to organize current open tabs. This is an example of splits. If anyone wants to know how to do these splits, uh, or doesn't know how to do these splits, uh, the way you can do it is you can colon sp, space, and then a file name. Uh, so if you're inside your editor, colon sp, you can open two files like that, and the other one is vsplit. Uh, and they'll actually synchronize as they're open. And you can do that as many times as you want. And then to switch between them, you can just control W, control W, go back and forth, or control W uh, and then a direction using your standard directional keys. Not the arrows, obviously. Vim standard directional keys, JK, HL. Okay, so I try to divide my plugins um, in my vimrc and in my thought process into two categories. Uh, the ones that blend in and the ones that don't blend in. So I'm gonna kind of attack this in, in two pieces. 
First, I'm going to talk about the ones that blend in. What I mean by that is they just enhance the Vim experience without le letting you have to learn anything new. And the second ones are the ones that don't blend in or the ones that require you to learn new keystrokes, to learn new behaviors. Um, generally, I, like I said before, try to stay away from type two, but there are a few that I just I can't live without, so I, I end up using them. So we'll jump right in. Type one, ones that blend in. That is not working. Sorry. My directional keys have uh, stopped working. Okay. No, don't do this. Um, Yes. Yeah, I hit escape a couple times. Escape was doing it before, but even my arrow keys to move back and forth aren't working. I might pull the projector for a second. There it is. Try to escape. Uh, oh, is that neat? Nothing there. And no luck on shift command F or control command F. That's a uh, good mouse is still. Let's try alt command escape. Okay. Let's just kill it. So that can kill it. And then hopefully if we restart it, it'll be happy again. Okay. Okay, sorry for the brief interruption there. Okay, so the first type of plugins, ones that blend in. Uh, the first one of these is Vim trailing white space. So white space really pisses me off when it's inside of uh, my code. So I try to avoid any kind of white space that can exist. So what Vim trailing white space does is when you're typing, you can type as many spaces as you want, but if you type a character, then you type spaces, and then you move to a different line, it'll actually highlight the trailing white spaces. So it'll very easily point out that you've got trailing white spaces, which you can go and, uh, sorry, you can go and just, just get rid of. <clears throat> the next one I'm going to talk about is, is match it. So typically, if you're writing Ruby code, you can, uh, between the start and end blocks, you can hit percent. And you can move between the beginning of the declaration and the end of the declaration, which is super useful for a bunch of reasons. One, because it might be just useful to go to the end of the declaration. The other one is you can combine it with something like V percent to move to the, the end of the declaration and get the entire block. Um, this is something that you just kind of have to experiment with. Over time, you might find more uses of this. And this is not match it, though. This is just Vim. What match it does is it adds a whole bunch of other semantics, or sorry, a whole bunch of other uses to the same so if you have some HTML, Matcha will let you switch between matching tags. Uh, this is typically not how Vim works. Uh, Matcha adds this behavior by expanding on what the percent operator can do. The next one I'll talk about is Vim Pasta. So let's say I have a file. It's got a class in it. And it's got a, a method in it. And now I want to go here and I want to hit Control P. So typically what's going to happen with Control uh, uppercase P is it's going to insert above my line and then put me at the beginning of the line. What Vim Pasta does is it makes it so when I hit, uh, sorry, Control O, uh, that it actually goes and indents it to the correct indentation based on the, uh, whatever the surrounding code is. So this is nice because uh, if you're ever used to hitting uh, shift O and then hitting tab tab, you won't ever have to do that again. Uh, these kind of things I think should just be part of them. The next one is Syntastic. So if you don't use Syntastic, you're probably really missing out. So what Syntastic does is it'll actually hook into uh, different um, 
lint checkers. So for different languages, you can actually automatically lint check your code inside Vim. This is something people with other editors are probably really used to, but in Vim, you're not used to these niceties, so Syntastic gives you some of these. Uh, you can, um, so if I go here and I type that, you're gonna get these warnings. So it's gonna tell you on the bottom here what the warning is. So for this, it's saying that I have mismatched indentations because I misspelled def. And at the end, it's gonna say that it doesn't expect the keyword end because it already got the end from line four. The other neat thing about this is that you can actually hook in custom syntastics. So this one here, I'm hooking in our RuboCop rules. RuboCop is a lint checker uh, slash style checker for Ruby that will automatically correct you of things that even though they are proper Ruby, probably aren't what you wanna do. So one example of that is uh, maybe trailing commas. Uh, RuboCop doesn't like trailing commas. So even though this is proper code, I'm gonna get a warning saying that I should avoid a comma as the last element or the last uh, item of an array. Also get a warning saying that this class has no documentation. Who used this super tab? This one, I couldn't use Vim if I didn't have this, so. Uh, So what SuperTab will let you do is it'll do context-aware completions on your code. So if I have a whole bunch of methods, let's say I wanna hear you use something here, I can just type capital S and hit tab. And tab is all you have to do to complete the rest of the work. And the cool thing is that SuperTab is context-aware. So if it notices that I'm using the, um, every time that I call a thing that, sorry, every time I call something, there are certain methods that are, uh, like, are called on something, the class, it will suggest those first in its list of suggestions because it knows that those are ones that I typically associate with something. So, super tab. It's a must have. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the second type of plugins that I use. These are the ones that don't blend in, so these probably be a little bit more interesting for anyone that is interested in that. So the first one is called Zoom Win. So how many times have you had two windows like this or maybe three windows like this and it becomes very confusing which file uh, you're currently working on. You wanna see a little bit more of the file so you wanna bring it into a new window uh, but you don't wanna lose the splits that you already have currently set up. So what Zoom Win does is all you hit is you hit Control O and it'll actually focus as if that one was maximized on the screen. When you hit Control O again, you can make some edits, you can do whatever you want. When you hit Control O again, Control W, sorry. It'll go back to the exact splits that you had before you zoom wind. So it's just like as if you're maximizing that pane. Uh, this makes it a lot more bearable to work with panes, and this is why I say generally like splits everywhere, is because if you use splits everywhere, you're gonna run into this situation, you need a way out of it. Uh, zoom wind is the way out of it, for me. Next I'll talk about T comment. So Vim doesn't provide a really handy way to do language agnostic comments that are kind of block aware or code aware. Uh, T comment fills that gap. It gives you first uh, the double dash, the control double dash will give you a uh, comment and uncomment on a single, uh, single line. And if you actually do uh, control dash P, it'll take the entire method. So this is really useful if you want to take an entire block and comment it. It'll even do things like this. Uh, it's smart about how it puts them back, so if you do that, it'll comment it, and it knows to not remove the comment on the way out, unless you break it. Uh, it knows to put everything back as, as it had it. Vim Fugitive, I saw you guys had Tim, Tim Pogue speak here, so probably he told you about Vim Fugitive, and if he didn't, I will tell you about it right now. So what Vim Fugitive is, Say you have a spec helper and I wanna see inside this file, for example, what the git blame of this file is. Typically I would leave Vim, go do a git blame, but with Vim Fugitive I can just do g blame right here. And it'll actually give me a quick fix window with the git blame directly inside of it. Uh, this is convenient for just lining it up against what you currently have. You can also do other neat things, like let's say I add a line here and I put, uh, hey all of you, and I do a g uh, diff. 
will actually construct the diff just like this, and you can see the one on the bottom and the one on the top and see how they differ. Uh, if it wasn't so big, the gdiff would be even more useful. Uh, if, it's, if it's smaller, the gdiff will actually place the two side by side uh, in vertical splits, which is a little bit easier to see uh, because it'll actually put these gray lines at the places where inserts happened on the other side. So you get that nice lined up view just like you expect inside of something like CGIT or, or uh, GitK. Control P. So how many times are you inside Vim and you want to take a file name that you know exists and you want to open it? Uh, control P is really use useful for this. So you basically hit Control P and you start typing the name of the file. In this case, I know I want to open engine, so I just type EN and you see it's already got it there. So if I hit enter, it'll actually go open that file. And you can do that. Uh, you can also configure control P to either use a, a most recently used or best match. Uh, I use most recently used most often because it turns out in a larger code base, I'm typically editing the same files over and over again. So this makes it really easy to, to, uh, to switch back and forth. It even does things like uh, knows what you have open and what you don't. Uh, Vim Sparkup, this is a super special use uh, Vim plugin that I keep around just because I like <laughs> it so much. So you want to write an HTML skeleton on a page, and you know generally how you want it to look, but you normally would end up copying and pasting a bunch or writing the exact same thing over and over again. Let's say you wanted to do uh, an HTML bot with a body inside of it and you're using um, bootstrap, so you want a container element. You want two, two rows. On each of those rows, you want uh, three columns. Uh, at medium, it'll be, it'll be a four width, and at small, it'll be a 12 width. Um, and you're gonna wanna have three of those per row. Inside of each of those, you wanna put an anchor tag that uh, says hello inside of it. And inside of the anchor tag, you want a responsive, uh, responsive. <laughs> so basically what it does is it takes exactly what I type here and just push the whole thing out into a tree. You can even climb back up the tree. So if you say you want to go back up, you can put something next to it can go a couple levels back up. You can put two things side by side. So next to the images, if I wanted like a, maybe a div there, I could have that too. So this is just super easy for taking a layout that you know you want built and just making it happen. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, VI and Tmux and how I use them together. So uh, I guess. For those of you that have used Screen in the past, Tmux is a, a similar thing uh, to Screen in that it's a, it's a terminal multiplexer. Uh, I guess the name is more obvious in, in Tmux, but what that means is essentially this. It means that you can, it means that you can have multiple uh, panes open at once inside of a given window. You can even have multiple windows. So you think like Vim's ability to split, except uh, built into something that can do things that aren't Vim. It can just be like anything. Um, the other neat thing that I use Tmux for often is that if you're actually SSH into the same box, you can pair over Tmux. Uh, so you can actually move the cursor together, uh, both type, and you'll both see it on the screen. So, and it's much, much faster uh, than trying to pair over like a typical like, VNC session or something. Uh, so we, we use it sometimes. Uh, there's a clock up there. I don't know why you'd ever want a clock. You know, sometimes I find myself doing it, though. Um, so you have... Uh, Tmux, you typically open Vim inside of Tmux. And I guess if you want a, a clock, you can have a clock. I don't know why you want a clock. Um, so uh, here is another place that I enforce purity typically. Uh, I'm not a fan of if anyone's seen the X-Term integration that uh, Tmux has. It allows you to drag windows around and automatically get, uh, I guess, free copying out of X-Term. I'm, I'm not a fan. I typically run these things full screen, so I don't really have a use for the whole drag and all that. Uh, the other thing is that the X-Term integration gives you, it gives you the ability to easily lay out the panes, but I'll show you in a second how I get around that. 
Uh, and just like in Vim, uh, I use minimal remaps. The only remap I use here, I just started using like two days ago, and what it does is it gives you uh, Vim arrow keys inside of Tmux, so you don't have to move your hand over to the arrows. I also use a thing called Tmux Editor. So let me just show you briefly uh, how the pane switching goes, and I'll show you it. Did it again. Okay. Uh, so what Tmux Editor is, if I open two panes or three panes, uh, Tmux actually has these things called layouts built into it. So if I hit Control B space, this is one of the typical layouts. This is one, and you can actually cycle through these. There's some pretty useful ones. In fact, my favorite one that I use every day is, I don't remember the number for it, um, is this. So on a, on a larger screen, what it'll do is it'll actually shrink the left column over, and it'll keep the right column big, so it's kind of like a master and then a, a child window. And Tmux Inator lets you specify these layouts. So here, I want to create a window called Editor with a layout called Main Vertical, which is what that layout's called. And inside of it, I want Vim and IRC, which is an IRC client. And what this will do is it'll actually, you type Tmux Inator start project, and it'll spin up a Tmux session that has exactly those commands started already. Um, so if you're not using something like, like a, like a, maybe like a, why am I blanking on this? A vagrant box or something for your development. This is useful to kind of spin up an environment quickly that you use often. Even just a development environment. You might have a front end app and a, and a web app, and you want to be able to quickly go into your default editing session for both of those. So this thing's great. Um, that's pretty much it on, on Tmux. I don't do much uh, other than just use it. Uh, so that's pretty much it for my, my configuration. This is where you can find my dot files online. They've been evolving over about five years. So if you want to see back before I used Wundle and it's just a whole bunch of files, this is a good place to look. And uh, thank you for having me. It's good to speak. And uh, if anyone has questions, of course. Any questions? Do you create any plugins for your own? Sorry, can you say that again? You know, I wrote a few uh, back in the day, but I don't use any of them anymore. Uh, I should mention this while I'm here. So this is uh, Square. Uh, for anyone who's seen this, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. Square has a package called uh, Maximum Awesome. It's a Tmux and Vim integration that does, uh, it has a lot of plugins. It's pretty opinionated, but it, it does a lot of the things that I, I showed you here today. Um, and that's written at Square. Any other questions? Uh, you can't. So for that, I end up using act.vim. Uh, or you might use ag.vim, which is pretty much act.vim, but for Silver Surfer. Um. If you have two files open, it's smart enough to, between buffers, autocomplete. But it's not smart enough to pull out of the directory. Uh, so basically, like, if you have one Vim session and it has that file somewhere open in it, whether it's in the background, in a different window, in a different pane, in a different split, uh, in a different tab, um, it'll still be able to autocomplete it. Okay. So it basically searches through all the buffers that are currently open. Okay. Use what? No, I don't. Yeah. On on here or? <laughs> okay. I've, if anyone's ever heard of um, uh, Hastepin, has anyone ever heard of Hastepin? No? Basically, it's a paste bin software. Uh, there's also, uh, what's nice about it is you can actually copy an entire Tmux, or sorry, S, um, BIM buffer into Hastepin and then see it there. So I don't know if that, that's a good answer, but I do that pretty often. Any other questions that I can? Did anyone learn anything, or did I just waste your time? <laughs> yeah? Oh, cool. Well, thank you again for having me. And if anyone has any more questions, find me.